All right. So welcome back again, everyone, for our fourth podcast here with Ma'am Pia, a.k.a. Moonshine. So um, this week, we'll be exploring the topic of human development or how people uh, develop across the lifespan and the different biological, social, emotional and um, other processes that take in, that come into account when we develop across the lifespan. So uh, I guess we can start with asking the general question of um, why study human development and what can we learn from studying people at various stages across the lifespan? All right. So usually when I ask people um, why they're taking up psychology, um, the most common answer, if I try to agree with all the answers, is that, oh, I, I'm studying this because I want to understand people. And um, the study of human development, to me, that's like, this is one clear way that one can really understand people. And uh, if you talk to psychologists, um, they will really say, okay, so how do you want to understand it? Psychodynamically, developmentally, uh, cognitively. So this is really one of those um, major areas of understanding uh, why a person does this thing or that thing. It's understanding their, uh, how they develop. Okay? So that's where the study of human de development comes in. And maybe the question is, what is human development? Mm -hmm. How do we study this? So uh, human development, really, uh, you can just imagine um, a lifespan, okay? And that lifespan being cut up into various stages and um, understanding what happens in those stages, okay? What happens in general in a person's life, um, Hopefully, uh, the theories that develop are we try, psychologists try to make it, uh, try to understand these movements um, as much as they can and find those patterns that are applicable also across culture. Mm -hmm. And so that's, um, that's the study of human development. But then, of course, um, there's also, we also have to consider how culture plays a part. So uh, as maybe you listen to the things we talk about now, um, in the next few minutes, we can think of, oh, how is that true for me? How is that true for my life? How is that true? And how would that make my life different, for example, from someone who grows up in a different place with a different culture? Okay, with a different set of rules, with a different kind of environment. So those are some good um, questions to keep in mind as we talk about the various stages. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, um, we what we can learn from this is really a very one very clear way of understanding people. Okay, because yeah, we all as long as we're alive we're all in one of these stages or another. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what we could talk about today, really. What, what are these stages? Um, how do we know people through these stages? And um, so on. All right, so I guess we can base our discussion on the, or anchor it on Ericsson's psychosocial stages, considering it really uh, covers how mm -hmm. the, the stages from infancy to late adulthood. And you mentioned that culture plays such a big role in our development. So can you talk about uh, what is the role of social relationships in resolving these various crises we have in Ericsson's psychosocial stages? All right, so just the title of the theories, the psychosocial stages, um, you really can already see that um, each stage is about a relationship, okay? uh, a social relationship. And when we track a person's life uh, the way Erickson did, we'll see how each stage is characterized by a particular relationship. Like first, for example, the first stage, which is trust versus mistrust. Um, this stage is 
uh, infancy. So it's really the main relationship of any infant mm -hmm. is with whoever it is uh, who basically feeds them. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's child and primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. And the way Erickson framed uh, this um, stage is that there is a conflict. Okay, there's a crisis and the crisis is between trust okay, versus mistrust mm -hmm. and the crisis of trust is really about okay do i trust that my caregiver will feed me mm -hmm. my hunger will go away and my caregiver will feed me because to a little baby that's all that's the whole world whether i eat or not mm -hmm. so that's the experience of trust is my caregiver will feed me and i will uh, this hunger will go away. This hunger will not kill me. Okay. Um, and then the experience of mistrust is I'm never going to get food. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm never going to feel full. I'm never going to be satisfied. And of course, I mean, you understand that when I say things like this, I don't mean babies have this, this concept of uh, I'm going to die or I'm going to live. Just the whole experience of being physiologically hungry is discomfort. And discomfort is pain. That's why babies cry. But being physiologically full is comfort. And so, and that's all they know. That is their whole experience. They can't move. They can't really think the way we do they get they're just receiving their sensorial information um which is quite developed naman after a bit um except for their motor functions so their motor functions they can't really control their bodies that's why all their whole world is the person who carries them the person who feeds them that's it so that's the relationship that we look at and that forms a person's behavior um, when they're that young. Mm -hmm. So that is a crisis of trust versus mistrust. Mm -hmm. So how does that form uh, a person, like a person's personality or a person's behavior? Well, um, a baby will always have an experience of hunger, okay? because babies can't talk. Mm -hmm. How will they say, ah, oh, I am going to get hungry in five minutes. Please mm -hmm. feed me now. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, they will feel hunger and then cry. Right? Mm -hmm. So they will always have that experience of mistrust. Right? But then if they are, if their needs are met by their primary caregiver, uh, then they will also always have an experience of trust. So it is normal to have both sides of what we call the crisis. Um, um, Erickson actually calls each side um, um, a dystonic side, meaning it's uh, uncomfortable, you don't like it. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, mistrust and the syntonic side. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says that each crisis you have to experience both, but mm -hmm. uh, you just have to have a little bit more of the syntonic side. Mm -hmm. And then that allows you to form um, what you need basically to solve to help you through the crisis of the next stage so there a baby learns to know that okay the world is not at their beck and call they will feel hunger but even if they feel hunger or mis the experience of mistrust they can trust they can know that eventually their their food will come they trust their primary caregiver mm -hmm even if they do have these uh, uncomfortable experiences. So, so there, that's, you know, I find this really funny because <laughs> it's like, wow, the moment we're born, okay, we have issues, we have trust issues. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what Erickson is saying. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and those issues are the things that teach us things. So mm -hmm. I guess babies learn to trust. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's one stage okay? i suppose we can go on to the next <laughs> all right the next stage is the stage of um autonomy versus shame, shame and doubt, and doubt. Okay? 
So at this stage, the baby, okay, so we're really tracking the growth of, of mm-hmm. a person. So at this stage, autonomy gives us shame and doubt. Um, what are the ages for this? I know this happens when the baby can start moving already, can start walking. Mm-hmm. Um, they can start exploring the world. They're starting to touch things. Yeah, so maybe 18 months mm-hmm. to like three years old. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, and at this point, you can also see that um, develop development or the markers of development are very physical. Mm-hmm. Right? So in general, babies walk at this age. Okay? Um, so definitely cross-cultural. It has nothing to do with culture. It's just mm-hmm. everything to do with um, how you... How, how human beings just develop physically. Literally grow, yeah. yeah. Um, but but um, so autonomy versus shame and doubt is about a, a person's experience of their bodies of being more now physically autonomous. Mm-hmm. They can literally walk away or run away from their primary caregivers because they can mm-hmm. move around. They can reach for things. Mm-hmm. Um, they, and you know this is when babies uh, or toddlers um, yeah like staple their hands just because uh-huh. they're curious. They put their their hands inside the electric fan. It's the terrible toddler yeah, phrase yeah, as terrible parents. Twos. Terrible twos as parents call it. Yeah. Right. Their favorite yeah. word <coughs> is no. Mm-hmm. They just, now they know they can say no to things. Mm-hmm. So it, that's the experience of autonomy. Mm-hmm. Uh, where oh, they know this is my body. I can explore physically. I can literally go to that place and look at that thing that makes mm-hmm. me curious. Mm-hmm. So that's the experience of autonomy. Mm-hmm. Um, but thing is, not all things are safe for uh, little children. Mm-hmm. Like putting your hand in a boiling pot mm-hmm. is going to harm you. And stapling your hand to, just because you're curious what will happen is okay. going to hurt you. Okay? Mm-hmm. So that's where the experience of shame and doubt also comes in where you're probably going to get reprimanded, you're probably going to get, uh, you know, even if you get screamed at in panic because, you know, somebody's panicking because you're about to run out into the street, mm-hmm. that produces feelings of shame and doubt mm-hmm. in, a, in a child. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I did something wrong, that's shame. Oh, I'm not supposed to do that, that's mm-hmm. doubt. Okay. Mm-hmm. So again, um, looking at this crisis, autonomy versus shame and doubt, Erickson will again say that, okay, the feel the feeling of shame and doubt is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, you need that to learn mm. boundaries, to learn to stop when your mother screams because mm. you're going to get hurt. Yeah. Um, so some of that is important, but mostly you really, what is gr- good is if a child learns that, oh, uh, I can explore the world. I can learn new things. Mm-hmm. I can do this. I can grasp this and pull on that. And um, that's when the child, this person, begins to become curious to learn new things. That's, those are um, really important for a person's development. Mm-hmm. And I guess here is also where culture really. Um, plays a part you know some cultures or some families allow their children to run around and you know mm-hmm. like roll on the floors and <laughs> climb trees even when they're very young and some some parents don't do that mm-hmm. and what these differences with upbringing with parenting styles will create is the differences that maybe now we, we can kind of see later on some children are more independent or unruly because mm-hmm. their parents didn't give them a lot of shame and doubt. It gave them a lot of autonomy, but then maybe these are the children who also, uh, I don't know, maybe the bruised, you know, like mm-hmm. scratched um, children, but they're very independent. Okay? Mm-hmm. And then some children, they, they will not even try. Okay, They will not explore. They will mm-hmm. not uh, do this. So, um, I don't know, maybe that's also not so great, okay? mm-hmm. um, because too much shame and doubt uh, can cause, can literally train a child to be anxious, 
Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, like, for example, helicopter parenting is very high control parenting. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with that term. Are you Can you explain with what helicopter parenting is and how it affects the, yeah. how the child behaves? Yeah, helicopter parenting is very, it is basically very highly controlled parenting. Mm -hmm. um, the child's actions are very controlled, like, um, it's usually towards perfectionism and uh, mm -hmm. high high performance. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, to palang ting tuwa na magmas kanyan. Um, but it's at the at the time when really a sense of autonomy over their bodies is very important. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're not allowed to do that, to explore that way. Uh, then they have less of this experience of autonomy and more of the experience of shame, shame and doubt. So yeah, it starts to build this personality of questioning the self, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, not being so curious, okay? mm -hmm. only, only engaging with what they are allowed to. Um, so whatever is in the box that is prepared for them. Like even their experience of their bodies, like their experience of feelings, for example. Um, these are, yeah, those are some of the issues of people who uh, have anxiety when they grow up, right? Because mm -hmm. they're like, they, because they, are, they grew up in such a controlled environment, they ha now have no controls mm -hmm. of their own. Mm -hmm. And that's a very anxiety ridden state. Mm -hmm. And they become um, very controlling. Is it like a way to exert control over their own situations? It could be. Mm -hmm. So um, this is also like later on, we'll talk about it in the mm -hmm. uh module. This is also the part that corresponds to um, Freud's um, anal stage, mm -hmm. where it's really about control. Um, so some people develop um, because they are so controlled that they learn to be so controlling. Mm -hmm. Some people, because they are so controlled, the moment the controls are gone, they're like, ah, because they didn't get to experience that. Mm -hmm. so, so here, even just one stage, like just the second stage after infancy, you really get to see the different variations that could happen because of the differences in the cultures where we grow up, okay? Mm -hmm. The differences in our, our relationships. Did we get more autonomy? Did we get more shame and doubt? Um, and that's something that affects us uh, as we uh, grow up. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So would you say there's an ideal or so parenting style that kind of um, balances the need for autonomy and so the, a, a way to um, rein back the children in as a kind of uh, this, these are things that you are allowed to do and that won't hurt you. So there, there has, it's up to the parents to strike a balance of both. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's really where parenting styles com comes in, where you, there is uh, allowing for autonomy, okay? So encouraging curiosity, ex encouraging the wanting to explore, encouraging um, movement even, mm -hmm but also setting boundaries. Like one of my favorite, um, um, and it's actually quite a popular uh, sentiment now, is that you allow the children really to exercise their no, mm -hmm. their no power, um, but, but properly, okay? So if they're gonna say no, you don't, you're just not rude. <laughs> so you're teaching them a norm, okay? Uh, which is politeness, but you're also teaching them to have autonomy and power over their own bodies. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I see this a lot in social media, you know, like don't, you know, allow your children choice when it comes to um, do, do, even just kissing their relatives mm -hmm. or being hugged or being touched. Um, and that's really, to me, that's a direct that comes directly from this, this experience of, oh, you're teaching them autonomy, meaning that they do and they should and they can have control over their bodies. Mm -hmm. Even um, autonomy over their feelings, okay? You mm -hmm. can cry, okay? Mm -hmm. um, tantrums are, um, are a different thing, okay? So you teach them, it can happen here, even here at this stage where 
uh, the teaching of accepting of self mm -hmm. and the validating of your own feelings can come in. But, well, of course, children can't really control uh, yet their emotions, but at least acceptance of it. And then the adult has to be the control for a moment. Mm -hmm. So I do tell my, my well, parent friends and parent clients that, you know, um, you can't really, um, from this stage, maybe even all the way up to the next initiative versus guilt, uh, and then uh, maybe even up to the next industry versus inferiority, the, the developmentally speaking, their controls for managing their emotions have not loaded yet. <laughs> uh, um, their children that age are just really more ruled by their their midbrain, uh, mm -hmm. the limbic system. Their frontal lobes haven't really bloated in yet, mm -hmm. <laughs> so they can't control. But you can at least teach them to. Like for example, you need to cry, you need to shout, you need to, you know, throw a tantrum. Okay, put them on the bed. At least on the bed, they're not going to hurt themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and don't let them hurt you. Okay, mm -hmm. right? You can, if they're gonna punch you, don't let them punch you. You mm -hmm. you hold up a pillow and you teach them to punch the pillow, mm -hmm. like like that. Because so it's not just. You're teaching them control just in a, an age-appropriate way, mm -hmm. a, a, a developmentally appropriate way. Because if you shout at them and tell them to stop, well, the mechanisms for stopping just aren't there yet, so it's useless. Mm -hmm. And all it does is increases your control rather than their control. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there. So that kind of relates also to last module's um, discussion on punishment. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's all you can kind of like put that all together here um, um, as you try to understand those stages. But those, the, the two stages, um, autonomy versus shame and doubt, and then the one after that, initiative versus guilt, they're quite related. Okay? Mm -hmm. Autonomy is uh, about the body, so they have more control over their body. And then initiative is... Um, their mind. Okay? Mm -hmm. Initiative is more the curiosity. They start asking questions. Mm -hmm. This is also the age where they become more verbal. So mm -hmm. children start to ask questions. And, you know, since they really don't have a lot of uh, information that's already there, sometimes the questions can come out quite rude or, or really like, you know, there's no political correctness with children. They're just going to ask as they see there's no filter they just yeah there's no why filter. is this a certain way and they right. Don't. Mm -hmm. right so um and they're just curious so that's the initiative part right? mm -hmm. uh and then is the it other really side of it uh, is okay yeah yeah this is yeah. also the time when no inferior industry versus inferiority is that's what's called the school age mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so those three, autonomy, initiative, industry, these are all the different um, steps that really mean exploration, uh, knowing what you want, knowing what you want to commit to and finish. Uh, industry is about accomplishing tasks. Mm -hmm. Initiative is about being curious and wanting to ask things. Mm -hmm. Autonomy is physically, I can do this. Um, so it's all about that exploration of the world, okay, mm -hmm. in different levels. Uh, and then the other side of that is um, shame and doubt, guilt, and inferiority, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So so yeah, if there's too much of that on the other side, these are the things that we develop into uh, anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, too much inferiority, you feel like you can't accomplish things, you're a failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. don't know how to bounce back so you start you know it becomes mm -hmm. this kind of um thought process mm -hmm. too much guilt you feel like you don't do anything right you can't ask questions you can't mm -hmm. explore mm -hmm. too much shame and doubt is yeah so you kind of see the progression there um and i guess that's what happens when a crisis isn't resolved properly mm -hmm. um 
it will carry over to the next stage okay? and that's quality of the stages of development according to um, uh, Erickson okay? mm -hmm. um, I think he calls it the epigenetic principle mm -hmm. this stage is built on the next stage is built on the stage before it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a process of resolving the crises at a series of stages in order for the next crisis crises to be healthfully yeah. uh, resolved mm -hmm. yeah dealt okay. with mm -hmm. um and so yeah like even just this you can kind of think of yourself right how are you at that age mm -hmm. think of yourself now like you know how what are my thought processes how do i do i suffer from a lot of self-doubt where did i learn that that's something i actually um ask my clients to do um, mm -hmm. whenever they have these patterns of thinking, for example, the doubting pattern of thinking, oh, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, I'm a failure pattern of thinking. I say children don't automatically have that mm -hmm. way of thinking. So that means you as a human being, if you have that pattern of thinking, it means you learned it somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I ask them, where did you learn that? So we, we do uh, very often go back to childhood for them to remember, oh, it was this experience or that experience that taught me to develop this um, particular anxious way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So it's usually from from those, either from you know, it's either shame and doubt or guilt or or mm -hmm. um, inferiority. Mm -hmm. So uh, there. So I think immediately, even just now, you can understand. Oh, that's what learning human development is about. It's about finding out what are your experiences that will help you de develop into who you are now. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about it uh, that I find okay, is, because, is that these things, like, okay, if you learn the stages, that's not the end all and be all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also something that's true for the psychosocial stages. Just because you didn't resolve it doesn't mean you never will. Mm -hmm. It does carry over to the next, but you can still resolve it later on. And once you resolve it, it kind of also follows. All right, you resolve your doubts, you resolve, and that will help you resolve your guilt, and that will help you resolve your sense of inferiority. So I guess that's what therapy is for. Mm -hmm. That's also why they say, uh, therapy, well, they say, I don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. um, there's a term that calls therapy. Um, therapy is reparenting. Mm -hmm. It's literally a way for you to go back. To go back those, to the child we were, who had those experiences. Yeah, mm -hmm. and help you resolve those crises so that it doesn't bother you at this stage mm -hmm. in your life. Because okay? mm -hmm. you will always have that crisis. <laughs> Uh, there's no stage in life that has no crisis uh, to be dealt with. But if you deal with those things from your past, it will help you deal with whatever it is you need to deal with also at present. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that way of understanding is uh, developmental understanding of the self mm -hmm. and the problem. All right. So from being or learning that it's okay to be curious about the world and um, not feeling guilt or not putting too much uh not to dampen children's curiosity which is the guilt side uh how does one become industrious reaching the next stage so from um having the initiative to ask questions how does a child develop um industry and then con uh contrastingly inferiority all right well um at that stage what happens is the child usually and I guess this is where culture plays a part also, um, the child usually uh, is now exposed to a greater uh, group. Okay? It's not just the, the families, it's not just uh, the child and their pa the parents. The parents. Okay? The focus Moving is outwards. Them. Yeah, mm -hmm. now it's, this is usually when the child goes to school mm -hmm. or, um, the child's world just expands, so they meet more people. Now they have peers, okay? uh, and so um, I like to think about this 
age as when a person learns to commit to projects, commit to tasks. And you know how children, like younger children, they can be best friends with someone for two hours and then forget about them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but at this point, I guess because of the way the brain also develops and the way memories are now more, um, uh, are formed more, okay, as the child grows up, then the child can now uh, commit to tasks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. So now they can commit to subjects that are more long term. They can study chapters one to five and then have a test after the fifth because they can remember uh, those kinds of things now. Um, they can see their friends over uh, you know, a few weeks and stay friends with those people. Okay? That's also kind of like a task. That's also a project. Okay? They can now miss their friends over the break. <laughs> that kind of thing. They will want to uh, see these people again. They can actually say, I like this person and not that one. Mm -hmm. um, so bonds form, friendships form, um, their, their preferences come out. Okay, mm -hmm. um, And that's really what the, the crisis is about. Industry is about being able to say, ah, I like to do this. This is what mm -hmm. I like. This is what I want to finish. This is who I want to commit to. Okay? And there are successes in those tasks. I did finish it. I did pass this. I did get that grade. I am friends with this person. But there are also failures. Okay? I, didn't, I didn't get the star that I wanted. That, that boy fought me and now I'm not his best friend anymore. Okay? So these are the many experiences of inferiority that we might have through the school age. But again, okay, much like the past stages, you do need an experience of inferiority um, because that just that's just one of those things that happens to us. Sometimes we don't succeed mm -hmm. and right? sometimes we fail. Um, and it's so important to know the experience of failure, why? I'm going to throw that question back. Why is it important to know the experience of failure? Because I think it's because uh, life is rife with unexpected um, occurrences and things are just always not going to go our way. So I think it's very essential to develop resilience because when things inevit inevitably don't go our way, we have to learn how to cope with that okay. and rise above it. Right. Okay, so this is about the age when that it would be good to learn that, right? So again, much like I said earlier, if there's too much of the other side, that's usually what develops into um, disorders. Okay, so I've been focusing on anxiety a lot, um, but it would actually be maybe the things that could cause anxiety or depression. These mm -hmm. experience too much inferiority would me would could come from uh, what is what is a trait, the trait called perfectionism. So if there is such a high pressure to perform, mm -hmm. to to have good grades, to be liked, to be to be um, the good girl or the good boy, mm -hmm. that could lead to um, yeah too much perfectionism, which mm -hmm. could lead to too many experiences of inferiority. Mm -hmm. too much experiences of inferiority and that could manifest later on as anxiety mm -hmm. or as depression mm -hmm. so um, so yeah and um, I mean since we're here okay, um, much of these things although there is a way now to detect um, you know childhood anxiety okay, mm -hmm. although um, experiences of anxiety and depression in children, uh, they exhibit very differently. But um, so that's a whole different mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just what we now know as what is more familiar to us as anxiety or depression usually exhibits when we're um, when the person goes into the next stage, mm -hmm. which is starting which is. to go into adolescence and. 
um, intimacy, exploring the uh, the depth of social relationships and navigating social relationships, different kinds of friendships or even romantic relationships. Right. Okay. So yeah, the next two stages are when most uh, diagnoses are made. Actually, it's the adolescence to young adulthood. Mm-hmm. So, so the next stage, the stage of adolescence, mm-hmm. is what is the first crisis that um, Erickson labels as an identity crisis. So oh. this crisis is called identity versus role confusion. And yeah, so after um, the first two stages where it's really about, uh, oh, I, I am open to the world or I am close to it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, the question is, who am I? Mm-hmm. <laughs> who, who, who am I and what is my role okay, in the world? Um, and I guess it's really just good to point out that, well, this stage is probably where most of the audience is right now. Mm-hmm. Um, college students. And- college students, yeah. So identity versus role confusion is, um, shall we say, I would say, remembering my own experience of it, it's not that pleasant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it is um, developmentally speaking. I mean, physiologically speaking, also the brain is um, in a particularly moody time of its life. Mm-hmm. And so, just to go back, uh, I already said that uh, children, okay, um, are ruled by their emotions, meaning their midbrain is, you know, where a lot of the activity is, and their frontal lobe. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not fully developed yet, okay? but in adolescence, there's this weird interaction where the frontal lobe is starting to develop, mm-hmm. okay? um, but not yet fully developed. Okay? So there is a drive for independence mm-hmm. because the frontal lobe is there. Uh, they are starting to be more analytical, but mm-hmm. not quite fully. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're starting to question things, okay? but but they're also, because it's also the time, uh, especially uh, during puberty, okay? it's also the time where their hormones kick in, mm-hmm. where, um, so that's something that really causes swings, highs and lows of mood. Mm-hmm. Okay? So all of these things coming together, you start questioning things and they're so mm-hmm. mo- moody and emotional. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to be more independent, okay? mm-hmm. but your parents are still like, no, you're a child. Okay? Mm-hmm. This conflict creates this um, state that can be quite uncomfortable. Okay? Um, and maybe that's also why a lot of the issues from the earlier stages may get released mm-hmm. at this stage in a person's life. Good news is, okay, but this is normal. Okay. It's so, temporary. It's temporary. Yeah, it's really mm-hmm. part of a person's development. Okay. Uh, and then just go to go back to Ericsson. The two sides of the crisis is role, conf- um, role confusion mm-hmm. and um, identity. identity okay? mm-hmm. So um, if in the stage earlier I asked, why is it important for a person to experience inferiority? I want to ask that also now. Mm-hmm. Why is it the important for all these issues, uh, conflicts with parents, all these issues, um, you know, like, I don't know who I am, you know, um, I don't know what I want, um, I don't know, all these questioning of self that happens in adolescence, why is that important? Because that's the quality, that's what role confusion is. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want to do. Yeah. Why is that important? I think it's important because people have to learn to develop their own sense of identity or not even just identity, but their own sense of right and wrong even. So from just following rules or norms, it's a matter of thinking, does this, do these norms apply to me? Uh, and I think that's where also we become to start 
to be capable of abstract thinking mm -hmm. and how to uh, conceptualize things that we can't see despite having uh, despite having to um, know about love, know about uh, why rules are the, the way they are. So I think it's having that capacity to question it and decide for ourselves if, the, if these um, rules or ideas can be adopted into our sense of self, into our schema, yeah. into how we approach the world also. Yeah. So what you're describing really is with like um, that you're right. That's rule confusion. Okay, and you brought in another concept, which is um, the idea of formal operations. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. So in the the stages of cognitive development, um, there are more, but this mm -hmm. is the last one, the formal operation mm -hmm. stage. That's when uh, a person is able to now understand abstract ideas and hypotheticals okay so um and that's why uh, in adolescence also a person might start questioning because they can now think in hypotheticals they can think beyond what is in front of them and what is concrete um into the what ifs of life mm -hmm. and so um but that's also really important mm -hmm. that's a really important part of the recipe that a person needs to be able to know themselves and so the questioning and the wanting to explore um, that leads to a, what might be a turbulent time of role confusion but this is not a, a bad thing i like to say that you know maybe you have faces in your life that you're not that make you cringe now okay mm -hmm. when you thought oh i am a I don't know. What faces did you have? Oh, <laughs> did you have I, think, uh, I, I think I definitely thought I was going to be a rock star at some point. Like, okay. started learning how to play the guitar and Taylor okay. Swift was getting popular. And I thought that I just really want to be a rock star. And yeah. And other things like um, I didn't want to identify as being emo mm -hmm. or, or there's certain kinds of this is who I am, and I don't. Um, I don't want to associate with these kinds of people. So, yeah. Would you say also there's a heightened kind of self consciousness during this age? We like. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that is a part of it, um, mm -hmm. and it's called um, egocentric thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where my, especially younger adolescents, mm -hmm. have a heightened sense of they're being watched. People are watching them, so they're very self conscious or. Um, there's a lot of, there's a very dramatic way of looking at life. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is usually the part that makes me cringe because I remember myself mm -hmm. at that age and it's like, wow, so much drama. Mm -hmm. Like, and it, it's a combination of all these things, the questioning mm -hmm. and the height and um, emotional states mm -hmm. brought about by the changes in the brain. So just, just all these things, it's like a recipe for role confusion, mm -hmm. actually. And what I wanted to say is role confusion is important because if you don't try those various things, um, like if you never thought you would be a rock star, is there a part of you now that wouldn't be you? Yeah, I think uh, I wouldn't have taken my studies so seriously. Maybe I wouldn't have become so passionate about, about psychology, even though I love music. It's just that I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't have been able to explore this part of myself if I fully identified with one yeah, aspect yeah. only. But is there a part of the, the you that wanted to be a rock star that is still there until now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I still what appreciate it. Uh, so is it your appreciation for music? Yeah, my love for still singing and playing guitar and, All right. and listening to music every time. All right, so it wasn't a waste. Mm -hmm. It was just an identity you... you you wore and you're like after a while okay no this is not me but you didn't take it off all, all of it mm -hmm. you kept the piece of it mm -hmm. and that's what role confusion is for because our identity is something we build mm -hmm. or something we discover and if we don't build it if we don't go out and try all these different things to discover the little parts of it then we would never be able to build it we would never be able to put it together mm -hmm. okay if you just commit to one the one you entered with 
um, from the last stage, mm -hmm. then you'd probably be just the person, that child, or maybe, I don't know, the person your parents trained you to be, because that's mm -hmm. what most of our life was before this, mm -hmm. right? But that's why it's an identity crisis, because now it is, okay, you had all this training in the past and some of that is you, so you retain some of it, but now it's your turn. Explore and find out the parts that are you that you couldn't pick up in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what the stage is for. So, um, so yeah, so again, the dystonic side of uh, the crisis is important. And to me, at this stage, it's so important because if you don't experience it at all, you are likely go to go on to the next stage without knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the next stage, if you go into the next stage without knowing yourself, oh, how complicated that would get. Because the next stage is intimacy versus isolation. Where, um, again, uh, so in industry versus inferiority and identity versus role confusion, um, it's about the peer group. Mm -hmm. right? So it's about your relationships, uh, your, your friendships. Mm -hmm. It's about the, the greater social um, group but intimacy versus isolation is about your uh, significant relationships mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. so your significant others romantic relationships even significant commitments like your commitment to a career mm -hmm. okay? your commitment to something long term mm -hmm. if you go into that stage without having a explored mm -hmm. so that you could put together uh, an identity that is you, then oh, who are you finding a relationship for? Is mm -hmm. it the you your parents trained you to be, or is it you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, who are you finding and building this career for? Is it the person your parents trained you to be? Which I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Okay, that's a normal thing. Mm -hmm. But if you go on to the next stage you're basically looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife for the you that your parents trained you to be and not the you that you are mm -hmm. or you could be. Mm -hmm. And that might lead to some messy things. Okay, what, what are the, what, what, does, what do these two sides of the mm -hmm. crisis mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I would say that intimacy uh, the the side of intimacy, like for example, for the uh, crisis of identity versus role confusion, the side of identity is about knowing who you are. Uh, it's about building, you know, having a stable sense of self that you are now identify as um, you. And uh, then the other side is not knowing who you are. <laughs> Um, so you explore so that you can know you who you are in order so finally they can build each other. Um, both are important. Okay. In, in intimacy versus isolation, intimacy is actually knowing who you are in the context of a relationship. Mm -hmm. it, it is that. So um, it's having a sense of self even in... Uh, in terms of that, a significant relationship. Um, so it's about, um, yeah. So usually the example that's given here is a romantic relationship. Okay. Um, and you know, what's my usual example here? My usual example is, oh, do you have that friend or those friends who whenever they're in relationships, they disappear. Mm -hmm. It's like, where is my friend? My friend has turned into somebody else. Okay, and that somebody else is, oh, my friend is this person's girlfriend or this person's boyfriend. It's like there's a losing of identity mm -hmm. when you come into a close relationship with someone. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's extreme intimacy. Okay, where if the and this is what I was saying if you don't, if you don't form a stable sense of self at identity versus rural confusion, you will enter the next stage without a stable sense of self. And so you are more likely to kind of lose yourself naman, in this uh, relationship. And the problem could be that the relationship becomes your identity. Mm -hmm. And what, what, 
have you seen things like that? Have you had friends like that? Have you yeah. seen it like in the movies? Absolutely. I definitely have had friends who they disappear when they have a romantic relationship and they almost their interests change. Yes. So they totally adopt the interests of their significant yeah. others and they kind of almost even reject, oh, I can't believe that was me or I like wearing a, I used to love wearing pink, but now since he only likes wearing black, I'm only going to wear black now. And ew, I didn't, I can't, I can't believe I wore pink before. So okay. yeah, I see that. <laughs> right. The loss. So that's like the loss of identity. So now you can see another kind of interaction. If there's mo- too much, okay, I, I think it just very, it's the clearest in this stage. If there's too much of one side, whether it's the syntonic or the uh, the dystonic or the syntonic, mm-hmm. even too much of the syntonic is bad. It, it's it's not actually good for us. It really has to be this kind of balance where we just have a little bit more of the syntonic. Um, and that's that's what I think that is what Erickson was trying to describe. So uh, too much intimacy is actually loss of identity, loss of a sense of self. And that's where you need a little bit of isolation because you need that sense of this is who I am and these are my boundaries. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, that's what the experience of isolation is. So that's what, that is what that conflict um, entails. Okay? That's why intimacy versus isolation um, is also a crisis of identity. Mm-hmm. So in both and in both sides, you, you need both sides to form a stable sense of self within a committed, I guess, long-term kind of relationship. So that's why, um, I mean, the idea, I, I also, as I was studying this, came up with the whole, well, well what about the people who don't have relationships? Um, does it mean they never enter this stage? Okay. Uh, and so my other example is the example of commitment to a career, mm-hmm. to work, to to um, whatever it is you're going to do with your life. Okay? So it's also easy to see how we can get lost. Our identities can get lost in that. So, you know, um, the people who become super, super, super devoted to their work and it becomes their whole identity, becomes their whole um, sense of self. And that when they stop working, who are they? Mm -hmm. Um, And so they cannot form boundaries between them and their work. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's that's too much intimacy again. And again, so that's what isolation is about. Isolation is about learning to be yourself without the other. Mm -hmm. Learning to be independent. Learning to to have boundaries. Um, learning to have something that's just yours, okay? So, um, but again, too much isolation naman, um, what might that look like? Yeah. Right? If too much intimacy is like an overcommitment mm-hmm. and the loss of self, sense of self because of that overcommitment, uh, so the more normal uh, version of too much isolation is the opposite of that. You can't commit. Mm-hmm. Oh. You can't commit. Your, your sense of self is so... Uh, your boundaries are so rigid, you cannot let people in, and therefore you cannot commit to relationships, okay? or you're all aloof, mm-hmm. right? Um, and in the same way, this is maybe um, a carryover of too much isolation, is you cannot commit to a organization mm-hmm. or uh, a movement, because no, it me, 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 me. And these are my boundaries, and I will not let my boundaries be moved in any way. And that that creates for that. That's why it's called isolation, because mm. you are so rigid within yourself. You do not let anything or other people in, mm-hmm. and that's what creates the experience of isolation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, it's really like a balancing act at every stage, and. Mm. Um, support that and I really like actually how for Ericsson and it's so clear in the stages that you it's not good or bad it's not it's not uh you know good versus evil and you need both experiences Mm -hmm. um in order to create a healthy sense of self okay 
It's not about being absolutely independent and free. You do need to depend on other people. You need you need to be able to let people in. It's just you need to be able to keep your sense of self too. So a little bit of isolation, okay, boundaries and maintaining a sense of self, even without the other, is healthy. But you can still have that sense of self even with the other. And that's... Uh, um, at each stage, actually, we just didn't discuss it, and we probably won't even discuss it in the personality module because this will be discussed in more detail uh, when we get to personality, okay, mm -hmm. the subject personality psychology. But at every stage, a person can resolve the conflict and develop what is called um, basic strength. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, I don't remember the terms. Or what is called the core pathology. Okay. okay. So basic so, strength or core pathology. Okay. So of the the basic strength that is developed, um, I guess we will just correct this later with the proper terms <laughs> if that's not actually it. But what is developed upon resolving the crisis of intimacy versus isolation is love, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And for so for Erickson, and I think this is one of my favorite. Um, uh, explanations of what love is. Love means you're able to have a sense of self that doesn't dissolve even in the presence of the other, even mm -hmm. in the press of, presence of an identity with another. Mm -hmm. So you have an, you're an individual, but you are also, uh, uh, you are, you can also share. Mm -hmm. You can also be with another individual. You can actually form a unit that can be uh, together but you do not dissolve into each other and just become this un, uh, you know, undifferentiated unit. Mm -hmm. okay. That's a problem. <laughs> um, um, that's not love, okay, according to Eric Sun's um, definition. Mm -hmm. So there. Yes. So it's the balance of uh, independence and interdependence. Mm -hmm. and, and so knowing how to integrate ourselves with our important social relationships yeah. so after um developing a sense of intimacy and knowing how to be intimate with other people in healthy ways with boundaries what is the next step after that all right so um i guess now it's like um the area of identity versus our uh, local confusion and um intimacy versus isolation maybe um again okay just to bring in the idea of how these steps are universal but how they might show and when they might show is something that's not rigid so that mm -hmm. depends on the culture where you're from uh etc um so maybe the students uh watching this how maybe they already explore um some even overlap already to the intimacy mm -hmm. versus isolation mm -hmm. okay? or maybe some are well in like right smack in the middle of mm -hmm. identity versus role confusion but usually uh you know early uh young adulthood or mm -hmm. or late adolescence you're kind of like walking across these two stages mm -hmm. um but the next stage this is usually the stage of our parents okay uh and this stage is generativity versus stagnation. Okay. And these two, uh, again, just to go back to the main thing about Erickson, which is the conflict, generativity on the one end is about, um, uh, is, this is still about a formation of identity. So, okay, think about your parents. Okay. Oh, your parents are still trying to form an identity. And I was just like, yeah, <laughs> Erickson's like, yeah, okay, because there is a crisis of identity at each stage all the way until the end. So I like that concept also because it means that um, we never stop knowing ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's always a task for us to know. Uh, there's always a part of us to know and to grow and to build all the way until the end of the lifespan. Mm -hmm. So really, um, the building of ourselves doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and maybe once we realize that, we won't be so preoccupied about, oh, like, 
is this it? This is who I am? It's like, no, there's no... There's no Constantly stopping. evolves. It will yeah. always evolve, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so for our parents or like, the people who are in the stage of generativity versus stagnation, the identity now comes not from um, significant relationships or significant commitments, but uh, from what they make. Mm -hmm. Um, So relationship with uh, the things that they have built and committed to and set up. Mm -hmm. So in the traditional sense, um, love, uh, intimacy versus isolation can create a commitment which at the next stage will be generative, okay? mm-hmm. uh, which means it will produce something else mm-hmm. that uh, they will commit to. So in a um, traditional perspective, this, is, this usually means children. Mm-hmm. Okay? So at the stage of generativity versus stagnation, generativity is the wanting to take care of, the wanting to teach, the wanting to... Um, pass on knowledge. Okay? Um, so parents, so usually for this, we look at the relationship of parents to children. Okay, So par- parents will want to bring up their children. Mm-hmm. We want their children to grow. We want to teach their children. But again, the question is, so does this mean people who aren't parents don't ever reach this? Well, children, literal ch- children, aren't the only babies that are born into the world. Okay. Some people's babies are not children. They are what? They are careers. Right. right. Their mm-hmm. careers, their um, uh, whatever endeavor it was that they pursued. Maybe it's a business they grew. Maybe it's a movement they started. Okay. Uh, maybe it's an organization. Okay. So these are the things that we create. Okay. And generativity on the one hand, is is that, is the nurturing, is the wanting to nurture something, the wanting to, to grow it. Mm-hmm. Okay. The other side, though, stagnation. What is that? <laughs> um, and the my favorite way of trying to explain it is stagnation is the uh, feeling of not wanting things to change. Mm-hmm. So okay. there's like a rigidity or not wanting to evolve or stay right. stuck in right. that. Mm-hmm. So it is quite rather similar to isolation, okay? mm-hmm. where isolation is I don't want to change my boundaries, so I, I won't let anybody in mm-hmm. or anything in if my sense of self is so strong. Okay? Mm-hmm. Stagnation is I will not change anything because this thing I have committed to for years, I will not allow it to change. Mm-hmm. Right. So you can imagine parents not allowing their children to grow up, mm-hmm. right? Not, you know, being controlling and not allowing their children independence. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. So that's that stagnation. Like, oh, I, I bore you and brought you up into this world and now you want to do other things that I don't want you to do. Okay. Um, and or you want to be independent from me? How dare you? Okay, mm-hmm. that's stagnation, mm-hmm. right? That is not wanting to um, progress. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so, how might we look at that also? Like, what's the different? Um, in terms of like a career or in yeah, terms of terms nurturing of... a project or an organization that right. you... mm-hmm. okay so maybe not being able to let it go mm-hmm. okay or for example a common uh example is um bosses who don't train who, who have to do everything they micromanage because and they don't train other people to do any of the tasks that they do and that's stagnation because it's it's not allowing their their the the organization or business to evolve. Mm-hmm. It's not allowing anybody to grow. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the quality of stagnation. Mm-hmm. Um, or the most um, the most 
maybe popular example is you see people go through a midlife crisis. Yes, yes. Right? Where they're like, oh man, um, I don't want to grow old, therefore mm-hmm. I will act as young mm-hmm. as I can. Okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> do the things. I was uh, going back to the bachelor life or yeah. uh, trying to get back the style that they once had. Right, <laughs> yeah. uh, look cool again. Yeah, yeah. They get piercings, they get tattoos. Mm-hmm. Uh, they start to be hip. They want to try being hip again. Mm-hmm. All right. That's stagnation. It's, mm-hmm. um, it's that. It's a refusal to progress. So generativity is this wanting to nurture the next generation. Stagnation is just the refusal to let anything happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I guess by example of like the parents not wanting to let their children be independent. That's also a little, that sounds a little bit like too much generativity. Mm-hmm. Like um, like I am always teaching you. You are never taught. Mm-hmm. Like I am always nurturing you. Mm-hmm. You, you, I, I cannot let you Mm -hmm. Uh, be nurtured by other people I cannot let you be no longer my my child Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah so the two sides to me actually sound quite look quite the extremes Mm -hmm. look quite similar Mm -hmm. so now my question is what's the balance right why do we need stagnation what is the experience of stagnation supposed to teach us um, I think, <laughs> I think I it's I, the. All... I know that's a hard question. Okay, so I guess stagnation can also teach us that <clears throat> there are limits to the legacies that we can leave okay. on this earth, and that um, we or that leaving a legacy isn't necessarily the most important thing or that we don't have to um, pressure ourselves to leave a mark or um, yeah or be so preoccupied with uh, leaving that mark in society would you say that that's awesome I think I think that's already what happens when there's a balance but what is Mm. the feeling like for example what is inferiority for why do we need to feel inferior why do we need to feel stagnant Mm -hmm. right yeah so it also does really teach us the importance of evolving and that we can't it you need to learn that not experiencing or not moving forward is it that's how your mind opens up to other possibilities and why it's important to become more open-minded Mm-hmm. All right, maybe you need to experience failure in order to know how to succeed. Here, you need to be able to experience, I don't know, what, what does that really even look like? Okay, so we're talking in abstract here. Mm-hmm. What, might, what that might look like is stagnation is um, if you don't allow your children to grow into adults, your children will not want to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you're going to want to control their life. And they're like, oh man, no, I'm. I'm not 16 anymore. I should be able to make my own decisions. Mm -hmm. So it can cause a conflict between an adult child and the parent. Um, So so that kind of conflict can allow uh, an evolution of a relationship to an adult-to-adult relationship of parents and children. Or... Like, for example, you run a business and you only want to run it in this particular way, but the world is evolving. And if you are stagnant, then some parts of it will start failing. And then you will learn that you need to adapt. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think just to go back to the identity, there is an identity crisis at every stage. I think the experience of stagnation is the experience that... um, the one thing for myself, mm-hmm. right? Because that's what yeah. that seems to be what stagnation is. I want this so much just for myself, I cannot let it go, therefore I become rigid. Mm-hmm. But the one thing for myself is also important because the other side of it is I want it for the children, mm-hmm. the babies, the future. Mm-hmm. 
So you could also get lost in that, mm -hmm. lose a sense of self, just work, 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 work for others, but not for yourself. So that's the balance. Mm -hmm. um, the balance is to be able to um, give, but also keep. Mm -hmm. right? So this is where I think um, having uh, a midlife crisis isn't so bad. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a negative thing. It's just sometimes people get to that age and it's like, wow, I now have the time and freedom and money <laughs> to do the things I never did before. Why not? Right? That's a little bit of stagnation. They take for themselves now and don't, don't just give everything to their cause or their children. And now they give to themselves. Mm -hmm. So that kind of maintains the balance of, oh, this is who I am. I give it to myself. And that gets balanced out by the generativity. I take care of you. I give mm -hmm. to myself. And that causes, that creates a more balanced human being. Mm -hmm. okay? Otherwise, they'll retire at age something and they, mm -hmm. they never have had a life for themselves. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. So there, that's how I like to think about that stage. So how about what is the crisis faced by people who are at the age of retiring or, or grandparents age? Okay, so the next stage is um, the conflict okay, is called um, integrity versus uh, despair. Mm -hmm. All right. And now, okay, how is that up a crisis of identity too. So the stage before it's about uh, giving giving or, or keeping. Okay. Um, when you are able to both give and keep, okay, uh, you get to the next stage and um, the conflict of integrity uh, versus despair is that you are able to look integrity okay is being able to look back at your life and say oh i had a great life mm -hmm. okay. and despair is being is looking back at your life and say oh regret i regret mm -hmm. or and and you you regret because you look forward and what is forward is at the end of a life mm -hmm. and so despair can kind of be the fear of that the fear of losing yeah yeah the fear of dying the fear of dying mm -hmm. um and therefore the regret of not having time or energy or life to do anything about the mistakes of the past mm -hmm. okay. so it sounds this one to me sounds like well what's wrong with all integrity Right? Why can't you just look past, look at your life and just be happy with it? Mm -hmm. Why do you need to despair? Why do you need the side of regret and fear and thinking about your death? Okay, I know that's a hard question again, um, but what do you think? I think it's because um, it also goes back to knowing uh, giving back to society or giving back to previous generations because I think remembering only the positives negates the conflicts experienced in the previous stages and how all of those conflicts have contributed to the formation of ourselves. So I think experiencing despair or some kind of regret is, an, is also a, a healthy way of um, critically evaluating our life choices and seeing how all of our failures have contributed to our sense of self and mm -hmm. all of our successes and right. what we've brought to this world. Right, right. Because at this age, so you said this is the age of our grandparents, the telling of your story, of your life story, becomes kind of central to a person's life. Mm -hmm. Right. So it is still about teaching right so a little bit like about the generative stage is it's found here too but there's a lot more but it's kind of a little bigger it's not about your business it's not about 
um, you know, bringing, doing the right thing of bringing a, a child up. This is about your life, okay? This is about what did I do in my life, okay? So you're, you're right. I agree with that, that if you do not look at the mistakes in your life, then you wouldn't teach a very good lesson, right? Um, it would just be, well, it would be incomplete, okay? Um, like, for example, if people now are, um, actually, just remember, e even if we just take a look at the time, for example, during our grand, well, your grandparents and my grandparents are from different generations, <laughs> right? But my grandparents, um, they were alive during World War II, okay? Um, and so if if, for example, a person alive during that time, and the world has changed so much, and there are many things that were acceptable back there then that are no longer, that now we know are not exactly good things, mm -hmm. right? But they yeah. were just the way of life back there. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the way of how life used to be, and, and you're just like, no, this is it. This is all, it was all good. It was perfect back then. Then it doesn't lead to much more progression Mm -hmm. It doesn't true. teach a very good lesson. Mm -hmm. So I do think that's important what you just mm -hmm. said. Okay. So that balance allows for um a kind of generational learning, okay, that can be passed on to whoever it is that they are around, their their children, their grandchildren. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then another th another reason why I think that despair it is important that a person in old age experiences despair or, or at least faces death okay? because you feel that regret when you face death when you face the fact that you are going to approach the end of your life and um, I think that's extremely important because if you live in denial of death then you're living in denial. Mm -hmm. okay? That's a denial of something real and true. And what behaviors might that um, make? Okay, um, You're going to act like you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. Reckless behavior. Right. Living life uh, as kind of um, in a... Or, or not living it to the fullest because you mm -hmm. will still act like you did oh, in yeah. an earlier stage, mm -hmm. right? Actually, knowing you're going to die probably will make you live life to the fullest, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So, um, so I think the facing of your own mortality is something that actually helps you make better decisions for yourself, mm -hmm. okay? both for your own safety and also for your own, you know, like I remember my grandmother at a certain age, she's really like, you know what? Okay, I know drinking Coke is not good for me, but I know I'm going to die one day. I would rather be happy drinking Coke now than live longer and not drink, you know, be miserable not drinking Coke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I was just like, all right, there. <laughs> that's like, oh, that's integrity versus despair. <laughs> she has faced her own mortality mm -hmm. and she now can make this decision saying I know it's bad for me but I won't regret it because this is how I want to live my life mm -hmm. <laughs> and and so there it's it's uh it's a particular kind of identity see you can only have that that identity truly although of course there are sometimes we face you know our mortality or, or our death even before that stage but mm -hmm. um I think that's a particular flavor of identity that comes with old old age uh, mm -hmm. when you do face integrity versus despair. Because it's not just these little choices. It's like these little choices in contrast to your successes in, in, in the entire the life you've lived. For your own life, right? Mm -hmm. So so there. Uh, and that's, that's the last stage um, of a person's life. Integrity versus despair. Okay. All right. So... That Erickson's psychosocial stages paint how social relationships are really important to our developing our sense of self. So, how about aside from developing our sense of self, how is that related to developing our sense of right and wrong, or how we 
evolved to develop a sense of morality okay. so in in relation to Kohlberg's uh, stages of morality. All right. So let's go back to the first um, four stages. Okay. So I think the first four stages all the way to now. Let's go back to the first three stages. Mm -hmm. Um, trust, trust versus mistrust, where we're really there's no what what's is right or wrong when you're a baby. All you need, all you know, is how to eat and poop mm -hmm. and throw up. Um, so okay, <laughs> but then when you go into autonomy versus shame and doubt, and then initiative versus guilt, there's a lot those two, and then the she versus inferiority. Um, just the conflict actually. That it, it is as if that's a time in our life when we are being taught what to do and what not to do. Okay? Mm -hmm. The feeling of uh, shame and doubt is to teach you not to do certain physical things. Mm -hmm. The feeling of guilt is to teach you not to ask certain questions, mm -hmm. or at least the norms of, of, of exploring certain thoughts. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We learn this from other people. So. Yes, we learn this from other people. Probably our families, okay, mm -hmm. our primary caregivers, um, are in after a while in the she versus inferiority. I think that's actually even mostly our parents, like, mm -hmm. you know, our drive for success or 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 like feeling bad when we fail. Mm -hmm. That's to do with um, yeah, the authorities in our lives that we look up to. Mm -hmm. But it's really around this time that we develop kind of okay what is right and what is wrong so Kohlberg uh, would describe this part of a person's life as a person is pre-conventionally moral mm -hmm. it's called pre-conventional morality and pre-conventional morality is characterized by uh, you know what right and wrong is based on the consequences of an action mm -hmm. So if, a, if an action is followed by an unpleasant consequence, like you're punished, or you know that's wrong. Mm -hmm. That is what's wrong. And uh, if an if a action is followed by a pleasant consequence, you get a hug, you get a reward, you get even like physical pleasure, okay? Mm -hmm. You know that's a good action. Mm -hmm. It kind of directly related, relates to... Uh, Autonomy versus shame and doubt. If you get shouted at and you know you get startled, you oh that's bad. Running into the street with lots of cars is bad. Okay? You 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 touch your toy and your toy is something that you think is nice and it's yours, but you get shouted at for whatever reason. Okay. Now you will be oh playing with toys is bad. Okay. Because that's how preconventional morality works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whatever makes you whatever you do that is punished that's wrong whatever you do that comes up with an unpleasant consequence that's wrong okay so this is also where the idea of what is normative culture and what is actual experience that's actually what teaches us what morality is mm -hmm. so it's so if you imagine is everything unpleasant bad uh no because sometimes uh, when we feel discomfort, such as in like working out, or it actually makes us stronger, mm -hmm. or uh, we need to experience a little bit of nervousness in order to give a great presentation. Right, right. But is everything pleasurable, good? Uh, no. Also not, because uh, too much food maybe can make us feel sick, mm -hmm. or binge watching a show the whole day can lead us to feeling like lethargic or ignoring things that we have to do. So all right. Yeah. Okay. So we know that preconventional morality isn't that reliable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just because you're punished for something, does that mean that's bad? Mm, no. Okay. Because it also it could also depend on the the morality of the person punishing you. And it's not necessarily uh the absolute right or wrong thing because it's also based on what they've told you or what they're conditioned to believe is right right and just because you're rewarded for something again doesn't mean it's good mm -hmm. okay. 
But so you can see here that the morality, the morality of, of children is quite, it's something that helps them survive, meaning, you know, if you get shouted at and you don't run to the street, you know, that's bad. That will help you survive. It will help you conform, okay? But it's not quite morality. It's not really about good or bad. It's about what you get rewarded for and what you get punished for. And sometimes that has nothing to do with morality. It has to do with the punisher or the reward. Um, so, like, here we could really go deep into the whole idea of what the society reward and punish us for. Because um, some people grow, some people still function in pre-conventional morality. We learn it when we're children, but some people stay there, mm -hmm. right? And the most dangerous part about pre-conventional morality is if you don't get punished, you never know that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. right so if you get away with it for example mm -hmm. yeah is it right or wrong for you and no. you, there's no one to punish mm -hmm. right? um so if this is the kind of morality that you develop if you stay at this level then you'll never regulate yourself really as long as you can get away with it because it does not fall it it is not followed by an unpleasant consequence then you won't stop yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so that. Um, but thankfully, free people go into the next stage. Okay? And at the stage of industry versus inferiority and identity versus identity confusion, where peer pressure, the the movement of the group of the bigger society, the greater relationship uh, with the greater group that's what starts to have an effect. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so from just uh, pre-conventional morality, which is like, am I gonna get punished or not? Am I gonna get away with this or not? Uh, am I gonna get rewarded for this or not? It goes into the, what does everybody agree on to be right or wrong? Mm -hmm. okay? Conventional morality. So the norms of the group, okay, of society, that is what um, a person now uh, thinks of as right or wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why we go to school, we learn rules, okay? Cheating is bad, don't cheat, don't copy answers. Mm -hmm. um, um, you have to eat your food. <laughs> um, you know that uh, hurting other people is wrong, okay? Although you kind of learned that even before in pre-conventional because you get punished if you punch someone. Mm -hmm. um, but now you, you actually start to learn rules. You actually start to know the, what is the law. Okay? And that basically conventional morality is rules and norms and laws. Right? Uh, so, so yeah, what are some conventional morals? Um, conventional morality also, actually also um, includes, um, like for example, subcultures. Okay? Mm -hmm. There are some right things in some cultures, in some subcultures that are not right in others. That's true. And so mm -hmm. conventional morality for a person from your generation, for example, mm -hmm. um, it could be different from the conventional morality of someone, somebody not from your generation, the generation of your grandparents. Mm -hmm. and so as for the generation of your grandparents, um, if I, I'm in a room alone <laughs> with a man. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit, uh, no, no, man. So, oh, so long. Grab in a man. Demon Victorian aging grandmother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, the things mm -hmm. that older people would be scandalized mm -hmm. about, and like younger mm -hmm. people are like, mm -hmm. that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Yeah. That's still conventional morality. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so yeah, at this age, we follow the rules. We learn the rules and we follow the rules. Mm -hmm. But my question is, are the rules always right at every situation, at every point in time? Uh, probably not also, which is why we need lawyers or a justice system or people who need to evaluate whether 
uh, this law upholds, which is an imperfect system, right? But we need these people to reflect on does this rule hold true in this situation? Mm-hmm. And does it, okay. does it protect the rights of this person? Does it? Mm-hmm. All right. Because if you look at it, some laws before, like for example, there's a time when I guess, okay, sorry, my, my example is slavery, okay? Mm-hmm. There's a time when slavery was legal mm-hmm. and yeah. perfectly fine the way of life. But that was a law. So it was conventionally moral once upon a time to own slaves. Mm-hmm. If you go back to the Roman era, it was conventionally moral at the time mm-hmm. to, there's nothing conventionally wrong about um, yeah, doing whatever you want to do with your slave because your slave is your property. That was a conventionally moral thing. But because of time and because of you know what we learned and how we grew as a species, as a civilization, conventional morals changed. Right? Mm-hmm. That's true. Um, yeah. our, uh, like for example, Political correctness, okay, mm-hmm. right? Is it political correctness? Actually, is one of the um, one of the prime examples of what is conventionally moral, mm-hmm. right? Uh, now I'm gonna call. It. Um, what about call out culture? What do you think of that? Mm-hmm. Is it? It has become conventionally moral mm-hmm. to call out mm-hmm. um, people publicly. Mm-hmm for the things that they have done that are wrong. Mm. But is that right at every point, all the time? No, because it, like really the cancel culture too, yeah, yeah. right? Um, if a person just makes a mistake or says something uh, that's taken in the wrong way and just mm. one, in one isolated incident, it can affect how everyone views that entire person's career or that entire person's life or that entire person's identity Mm -hmm. right but it could be that or say that person really did something wrong that person did something wrong and it's like needs to be changed but the judgment that comes after where at any point that that person does anything else they're like oh no, no 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 reject that person which has become quite conventionally accepted, right? You know, in, in some cultures, especially on the internet, why might that not be actually good? It is accepted, therefore, generally how people act. Conventionally moral to reject um, wrongdoing, mm-hmm. but why might that not be actually moral? Why we can question it, right? Mm-hmm. right? So if you question it, that's the realm of the next stage, mm-hmm. which is post-conventional morality. Mm-hmm. And post-conventional morality basically says, well, just because it's a rule, it's a law, or it's a norm, or accepted by a lot of people, doesn't mean it's right. Mm-hmm. What is right has to be determined moment to moment Uh, context-specific, situation-specific, guided by moral principles, meaning what are generally thought of as right or wrong, but not rigidly bound to it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So, Do all people progress to this stage from conventional morality to post-conventional? What do you think? (laughs) No, because there are some people who are stuck in uh, like this group think or... For example, like why slavery lasted or endured for so long because people were stuck in that kind of conventional way of thinking. And it took um, radical post-conventional thinkers to say that this is wrong and transform the policy. Right. And then it became conventional, right? Mm -hmm. So, but... Uh, of course, like now we still see how like there there's still a problem with that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, there's still a problem with that until now. So we're still struggling with that. Okay, mm-hmm. in in the world. But um, what about things like 
Um, and we don't have to answer this today because I know that these things are hard to talk about and it's hard to find the answer, but that's precisely the realm of post-conventional morality. Post-conventional morality exists because the world is not black and white, because there are things that are neither completely right nor completely wrong, but you need to determine your action based on what you know best, based on your judgment. And that's, to me, that's why post-conventional morality is not achieved, it's not a state uh, stage that everybody goes to because it's hard. Post to be post-conventionally moral means you have to study the situation, and you, you're right or wrong is based on your moral judgment. Mm -hmm. And and to, to do that is say it, it means you have to really think about it, and you really have to take the context and the situation, and it has to be a decision, right or wrong. It's a decision that you make. And the weight of that decision is not easy. Mm -hmm. It's it's easier to just follow laws. Mm -hmm. This is right, that's wrong. Follow the laws, right? Not following the laws, wrong. But yeah, so questions about, for example, um, that are really uh, relevant right now, maybe not here, because it's not talked about here, because mm -hmm. honestly, here in the Philippines, we're quite pre-conventionally or post -con or, or conventionally moral. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, maybe some of it, um, it because we're, we all have access to the internet, okay? we can all read about this. Look at the conversations that occur around abortion. Mm -hmm. Right, that's hard. It, but, but if you read about it, it's like, okay, there are situations where you can't, it's against the law, but is it right or wrong in this particular situation or in that particular situation? Mm -hmm. So to put a blanket that's wrong all the time, which is what the people who argue that okay, the laws around abortion shouldn't be that strict, okay, um, that's what that's a post-conventional argument. Mm -hmm. So to understand what post-conventional morality is like, you have to look at these difficult situations where there's no easy right or wrong. There's no easy black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and I know just me mentioning it might be controversial. This is like, oh, uh, what about um, uh, not quite controversial, but maybe controversial in terms of the Catholic Church? What about premarital sex? Okay. Okay. Um, what about uh, the really, really hard ones that yeah, I have no answer to, but I know it's a murky, murky landscape. Mm -hmm. But um the ethics of things like euthanasia right that's all like, like it's hard so and there's no clear answer um so that's the realm of post-conventional morality there's a lot of weight uh on a person's decisions mm -hmm. But it's also an acknowledgement that you can't really judge cleanly right, right or wrong just based on laws. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's more complicated than that. Yeah. Well, that's a really heavy way to end. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope that this discussion at the very least, um, can generate a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I always love talking about morality, Kohlberg's uh, levels yeah. of morality. It's, yeah. like, oh, it's such a complex topic. Yeah. And yeah. in Ateneo, we have like a whole philosophy yeah. um, course that doesn't mean for moral philosophy. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So watch out for that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea behind all of these things that you know are, I, I graduated from Ateneo, you graduated mm -hmm. from Ateneo. I think it's to develop post-conventional morality mm -hmm. to get us to actually think about mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. because, um, and that's important in our lives. If we want to live our lives consciously and on purpose, and you know all of that, then we have to question these things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, tiring to do that, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, you'll have to think about a lot of things and bear the weight of your own decisions. So, yeah. Okay. Always interesting. So I guess that's it. Yeah. So I guess that um, gives us a, a rounded out discussion on how we develop across the lifespan and the different um, crises and conflicts that we have that are relevant to our identity formation and getting to know ourselves and other people. So thank you, ma'am, for another podcast yeah. wrapped and can't wait for the one next, for the next one, which is on personality. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope the everybody also like asks their questions mm-hmm. because yes. I think this is the one where it's like yeah, oh, there's a, can generate a lot of questions. So I'm excited of, about that too. Mm-hmm. Answering. Don't questions. be afraid to send your questions in, and yeah, keep posted for the next podcast. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mom.